Well, we're in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. For those of you who may not know, we want to continue to be praying for our lead pastor, Pastor Brian. His mother transitioned to heaven yesterday afternoon. And she is now in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so uh, we praise God for that, that we do have a blessed hope. But just remember uh, Pastor Brian uh, and the family as they go through these next few days. And, uh, and, and I know that you will be faithful to pray for them. If you uh, want to reach out to them on Facebook, of course, Pastor Brian is on Facebook, and just uh, let them know that you're praying. I'm sure that it would be much uh, appreciated. Well, here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this is our part 2 uh, of our looking at being the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. A couple weeks ago, we looked at being seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. Today, we will... Uh, conclude with this part as we were in the first part last week of getting to understand of what it means to be the righteousness of God in Christ. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21 says this. It says, For he, talking about God, made him, talking about Jesus Christ, who knew no sin to be sin for us. Now I want you to notice something here. He says, He who knew no sin but uh, became sin for us. The word is sin and not sins. So in other words, what he's not talking about is our individual sins, but the actual sinful nature that we inherited from Adam. When Adam sinned, it thrust us in by that nature of now being sinners. You're not a sinner because you sinned. You're a sinner because you're a descendant from Adam. And then what happened is the second, the Bible says the second Adam was able to do what the first Adam could not do, and that was redeem him and his bride, that today we can be redeemed because he who knew no sin took on our sin nature to himself. I mean, that, 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 that right there is hard for me to comprehend. That we didn't love him and then he did this for us. He loved us before we loved him. And over 2,000 years ago, he took my sin nature, he took your sin nature upon himself. That's a big deal. And he said he did that, according to this verse, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. In other words, that we would take on the characteristics and be given His righteousness. Righteousness means to be in right standing with God. That means to be seen, as the Bible says, that because of His resurrection, we've been made just as if we never sinned. That, that's, that's, that's what the Word says. That when we place our faith and trust in Christ as our Lord and Savior, and the fact that He died, that He was buried, and that He rose again, that He literally tells us that we get to now take on, become partakers of His divine nature. And now it's not a sin nature, but His nature, which is the righteousness in right standing. That means when the God the Father looks at me, and if you're a believer today, God the Father looks at you, He sees you just as if you'd never sinned. He sees you in perfect righteousness. Not because of what you've done, and not because of what you do, but because of what He did. And that is the place that we, that we are and, and, and get to stand in. We're going to look at several scriptures this morning. <clears throat> As we finish this up, go over to Romans chapter 7 because I always say, you know, when, when you're preaching something and you're teaching something, it's important to know not what I say, but what says the Word of God because that's the final authority. I can get up here and flap my gums all I want, but if I don't have Scripture to back it up, then I'm just flapping my gums. And I don't want you to go out and somebody say, well, why do you believe that you're the righteousness of God of Christ? Why do you believe that, that you've been redeemed? Why do you believe that you've been made just as if you'd never sinned? I don't want you to say, because that's what my pastor said. <clears throat> I don't want you to do that. I do my best to stay 
as confident as I can in studying the Word, but I don't want that to be your answer of why you believe it. You believe it not because I said it. You believe it because His Word says it, and that's the final authority. His Word is always the final authority. And I don't care if it's me or, or Pastor Brian or any other preacher that you know. When they get up to speak, you make sure that it lines up with this book. Because if it doesn't line up with this book, then you just let it go in one ear and out the other. This is why you study to show yourself approved unto God. You're a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That way you can say, I believe this because His Word says it. And that's what I want you to know. And that's what we're looking at today with the righteousness of God in Christ. Romans chapter 7, starting in verse 1, Paul said, Do you not know? I love when Paul says that. He says that. I actually did a sermon series on that several years ago uh, on do you not know. And there's like, I don't know how many times, but it's, it's several times that Paul says that do you not know. In other words, this is something you should know, but if you don't know, you're going to know now. And so he says, do you not know, brethren, talking to us believers, he says, for I speak to those who, who know the law. Uh, we all know what the law is. We talked a little about the law last week because our righteousness does not come from the law. Even though many people put themselves in a, in a work uh, salvation, that will not get you to heaven because the Bible says that doing the deeds of the law, no man, no flesh can be justified. You can't be made just as if you'd never sinned by how good you are. And so he's wanting us to know this, that the law has dominion. Now here's what he's saying here. The law has dominion over a man as long as he lives. He said, for the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, so he's given a comparison. Because in their time, which is even kind of different from we, where our culture is today, but in their time, you were bound, if you were a woman, you were bound to the, the husband that you married for life. Even if there was a divorce, you're bound. That, that was the law. And so he's saying, now just as that was the law, he's telling them something uh, here that's important. That, but, but if he dies, she is released from the law of her husband. So then, so he's comparing that to a, to a truth that we have today. If while her husband lives, she marries another man, she will be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is free from that law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. Therefore, because of that, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. For when we were in the flesh, the sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members or in our bodies to bear fruit to death. But now, and that's one of those but now things that I love to talk about, something has changed when you get in Christ, but now we have been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter or the letter of the law. What shall we say then? Is the, is the law sin? See, some people say, well, you know, the law is sinful. No, certainly not, Paul said. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. Remember, that's what the law is given for today. It is to give us the knowledge that we're sinners. It can't justify you. Don't try to get the Ten Commandments out and try to keep all Ten Commandments. That's not going to do you any good. You're still going to be lost. Plus, if you understand the law... You would have to do it 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days of the year. And if you ever miss one little part at one time in your life, you're guilty. <laughs> so that's why the Bible says, There is none righteous, no, not one. That we all fall short of the glory of God. We have been, you know, God doesn't come to condemn because he says we have been condemned already. That's what the law shows us. We're condemned. 
We, and so he says, no, it's not that the law is not important. He says, on the contrary, I would not have known sin except for the law. He says, for I would not have known the covetous uh, unless the law said, you shall not covet. And so, you know, if we didn't have the law that said this, it's amazing that in this country who, who doesn't always want to follow God's word, the laws that God set forth, we still hold to in this country. Murder is, is sin. We, 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 we prosecute people who murder. Why? Because God's word says that it's sin. That's why we do that. So in a world that doesn't want to acknowledge God, then uh, you better understand that the reason why you believe and you have your standard of what is bad or what is wrong is because of God's law. Because that's what it does. It points out that we come short. And so the law does have a purpose. And so because of the dominion of the law, every one of us, in a sense, is what he's saying here, is we are married. Every one of us. You're either married to one of two. You're either married to one, the law. The law was cruel. The law, and I said this last week, does not grade on a curve. Okay? Bring me my water, dear. Thank you. I got a tickle in my throat, and I'm having to keep clearing. So I'm going to do some water here. Oh, that's so good, y'all. Mm. Oh, that's good. Thank you, baby. So that, that, that law is, means you're married to one. You're either married to the law, who is cruel and hard, does not give a curve. It just <laughs> demand, 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 demand. Always pointing out your mistakes. It always points out your failures. And it's a constant failure. You know, it's just like, Man, I just feel so beat down. That, that's what the law does. See, the law can only condemn. And so you're either married to the law, which all of us were before Christ. That's our state. Or you're married to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what, what we just read says. That, that because he willingly, this is what he did. He laid down his life for us. He was a he was spotless life so that we might take on that righteousness. Now, when I'm looking at two and they go, which one do you want to be married to? The law or to Christ? I, I think I'm going to take Christ. Because the, 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 the Christ doesn't condemn. Christ gives life. He gives everything that we need in this life. Where the law, just all it can do, show me what I'm not. I am not the righteousness under the law. And so this is what Paul's trying to get across to them and to understand that, 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 that when we try to go about things and get our righteousness through what we do, that we're literally looking at what he did and it makes it in vain. That he, if, if I can get righteous without him, then, I, then, the, then he didn't need to come. He didn't need to fulfill the law. He didn't need to die. He didn't need to be beaten. He didn't need to go through any of that. If I can do it on my own. But the answer, the, the answer to that question is you can't. You cannot do it on your own. I cannot do it on my own. Matter of fact, the good works that I do can't even happen until after I'm in Christ. And it says he creates me for good works. And so my good works, even after salvation, are not to keep what he's given me. That's a done deal. I'm in the position. I'm in a position that n the Bible says no man can take me out of. I'm in that position. Now, that will affect you, as I tell people all the time. You won't be sinless, but you will sin less when you begin to understand who you are. You begin to understand that you've been seated already in the position, in the spiritual realm, you're seated with Christ in heavenly places. Already at the very moment of your salvation, you were made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. You took that on, and it's because of what 
he did. And that's what puts us in that place. And so it's like, I think it's in Ephesians 5 says uh, that he's one day going to return for a church that's having no spot or wrinkle. How in the world in this day and time is he going to come back to a church who has no spot and wrinkle? Now, a lot of people immediately start saying, this is why you better start doing good. This is why you better start being this and you start doing that because he's coming back for a spotless bride. No, he's coming back for a spotless bride that he made white as snow. He did it. You're already there. He's coming back for a spotless bride. Why? Because he made you spotless. He gave you his righteousness. That's why he can come back today. You know, because he was going to wait for us to get ourselves spotless, he'd never come back. We would just might as well go to hell because that would, that would be it. And so, yes, he is coming back, uh, having a, a bride that has no spot or wrinkle or any such thing that's contrary to who he is because he has made us the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So, so when we get that and understand that, it does. It will change our, it will change our behavior. So, to not look at it as being married to Christ and having His righteousness, not on me, but on Him, to do the opposite, it literally leaves me stuck in an infant stage of Christianity. Because a lot of Christians, when they first get saved, they think it's all of what they got to do. Now, some of that's because some idiot told them, now you're saved, now you got to you got to do this, 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 this. And you can't do this, this, this. And they give you a bunch of rules and regulations. And so an infant says, well, that, that's how it is then. But we had to grow. The Bible, we looked at this last week that we want to grow up in all things in Christ Jesus. I want to get past those things uh, of just living in that infancy. I want to grow up. I want to grow up in Him. And so I don't want to stay an infant. I want to stay, you know, in, in that little rim that, because I, want, I understand that Christ fulfilled the law. Do you know the law had to be fulfilled? When, when Moses came down from the mountain, he was given the law. And he was one of the first ones to ever break a tablet and had to get a new one. Ever broke your tablet before? Well, Moses, Moses broke his tablet. And he had to go back to uh, Apple, and he had to get another tablet. And on that tablet was written the law. Now it says, we call it the law of Moses, but it really it was, it was called the law of Moses because Moses gave us the prescription that came from God. He's the one who dispensed the, that. So, he got that from God. He came down. He goes to the children of Israel, and he presents them the law. Now, while he's coming down, remember what they had already started doing. They had done forgot. They had, they had figured that Moses wasn't coming back, and because their righteousness and everything they were living with was in Moses and not in God, they just started acting a fool and, and acting crazy and worshiping idols, and he comes down and you know, he put Aaron in charge, and Aaron was, 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 was even worse than they were because Aaron came up with this story that all of a sudden that, 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 that they put their gold in the fire, and it just came out as an idol. Well, that didn't fly. And so he gives them the law. But then when he gave them the law, these people who were lawless, the first thing out of their mouth was, all that you have said, we will do. First mistake. All that you have said, Moses, we will do, and they have yet to ever do. Why? Because it wasn't meant to be on what they did. See, what should have come out of their mouth is when they heard the law, the very first thing would have been, Moses, this is is impossible I mean we're already not doing this we already got other idols that was part of the command not to have other idols well we've already got that one taken care of we're out here worshiping a golden calf now we can't do this then God would have been able to say you're correct this is why you need me 
And so today, we're the same way. People think that, well, I've got to do this. No, not going to happen. So if you don't do to get saved, that we, even when you get saved, you don't now step in to now it's all about how you do it. It's on what he did and how he, how he solidified that for us. He purchased for us at the cross. He did that for us. His life was given as a ransom for us. We talked about, you know, the, 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 uh, the inheritance that we have of the earnest money put down. Woo, man. That was, that was so good, Gavin. What an awesome word. That we all need to understand. You want to talk about secure? See, when you, when you do buy that house and you put earnest money down, there ain't nobody else can get that. It's yours. Well, I, hadn't pay, I ain't even gone to the bank yet. Doesn't matter. You put earnest money down. The Holy Spirit says, well, I ain't, you, you go, well, I ain't in heaven yet. Yeah, but the money has already been put down for you. You are the righteousness of God in Christ. You are made just as if you've never sinned. You're already forgiven. You're already, you, I love grace because in grace you get all the benefits up front. Where in, in the world you've got to do to get. He gives because of what he does. And then our motivation is now changed because we motivate through love now. But it's because of the, the investment and that's what it really is. That earnest money is an investment. You are the, he, the Holy Spirit is your investment of your righteousness. And He don't invest in junk. He doesn't invest in junk. And so included in that payment was our righteousness. It didn't say, okay, I paid for it, but. No, it's included. You know, you, like, you watch those infomercials. And, and they build something up, and they go, not only, and then they add to it, you know, Tina and I have a deal. We don't, we don't really watch too much just regular TV anymore, so we don't ever see no infomercials. But we had, a, we had a deal that if one of us was in the room watching an infomercial, the other had the permission to come in and shut the TV off or change the channel. Because if I saw it, and they told me, and it also, I, give me the phone. I can't live without this. And if she's watching it, baby, this is going to make me look 18 again. It says right here. And I'm like, baby, that ain't going to happen. I'm sorry. You're being renewed, but you ain't going back to 18. I was like, I don't want her back at 18, but I like her right where she is. So I have to know to cut that off. Well, what we have is real. And when he says, listen, you have been forgiven of your sins. You get to go to heaven one day. You're not going to go to hell now. It also, whoa, is there's more? Yeah, this also includes your justification, just as if you'd never sinned. It also not only does it twirl and whirl, but it also gives you His righteousness. Sign me up. Give me the 1-800 number. It's called 1-800-JESUS-CHRIST, my Lord and Savior. That's what you need. He secures it for us. He gives us that. It included in the payment. It's part of it. That we, listen, we could not hope to gain by keeping the law. It's just given for all of us lawbreakers. You imagine, I, I was before church, by the way, when you're heading out of here and we're maybe running, you know, a little bit later than, than some of the Baptists down the road or whatever, uh, don't get in a hurry to get to the restaurant because there's unmarked cars out there today and they would love to have a discussion with you about that. And so you better drive the speed limit. But can you imagine being a lawbreaker and he pulled you over and go, hey, I'm pulling you over today because you're speeding and here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you $100 because you were a lawbreaker today. That doesn't make sense. But see, that's what Christ does. We're lawbreakers, and he said, you're a lawbreaker, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you my righteousness. I'm going to give you heaven. I'm going to give you forgiveness. I'm going to give you justification. I'm going to make you redeemed. Wow, pull me over weekly, Lord. Go over to Titus chapter 3. Because I want you to see how he said it, how Paul said this in Titus. It, it just kind of, like I said, you, you, you hear, but every time you see the word, that's where the faith comes in. 
Here's what he says, Titus 3, starting in verse 4. He says, But when the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, then he makes this clear, not by works of righteousness which you have done. So he says, listen, the kindness and love of God has appeared to you. But know this, it wasn't by the works of righteousness what you have done, but it's according to his mercy he saved us. How? Through the washing of the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. See, do you see anything about you doing anything? No, it's all he did. He did it with his mercy. He did it with the washing of the regeneration. He did it with the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us, I love this word, abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That having been, there's that word, justified, made just as if we'd never sinned. Justified, how? By his grace that we should become heirs according to the hope of temporary life. Oh, no, 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 no. Not what it says. Didn't say temporary life. What kind of life? Eternal life. That means it, don't, it doesn't die. The seed that's been planted on the inside of you at salvation, the Bible says, is an incorruptible seed that cannot be aborted. Cannot be done away with. That's what it means. Cannot be aborted. You didn't plant the seed. He did. He didn't cultivate the seed. He did. He did the washing of regeneration. He did the renewing. It's all of what he did that puts us in that position. Now, some people, boy, uh, legalists don't like when people say that kind of stuff. I've spent many years as a pastor in hot water because I say things like I say. Because they go, you can't tell people how free they are. You can't tell people that they've made just as if they'd never sinned. You can't tell people that they've got grace. They'll go off living how they want to live. And I went, no, they won't. Not if they truly got saved, they won't. And I'm, I'm, I say this, you know, once again, you're not going to get sinless. You're going to sin less, but you're, you're, you're still going to fall short at times. But that's the problem with the church today is we're trying to condemn when they're already condemned. We're trying to do the condemning on people to try to convince them that they need to get right when what they need is Christ and then they're, they're right. And that it's not held on me, that it's held on him. And some people have a hard time with that. I mean, you'd be, you would be shocked at some things I've been called. Somebody even said one time, I was, I was preaching this after I had left my last church, because many of you know that I came from, from the Baptist denomination, that when I was preaching this, they said, you, that, that, that's Baptist doctrine. And I went, well, somebody needed to tell them Baptists, because when I preached on it there, they, they threw me in hot water, because that's not the way they saw it. They didn't see it as Baptist doctrine, because it's not Baptist doctrine, it's Bible doctrine. It's truth. And if we don't give people truth, then how are they going to know what truth is? And so we have to preach it. We have to proclaim how secure they are in Christ so they quit living the roller coaster life and start changing from glory to glory and their life matching up their position that they've already been given. That's good news, folks. That's good news. If a Baptist will ever get it, he'll say amen, I promise you. Pentecostals will run and shout. I guarantee you, if we ever get it, so we have to get it. So he, he says this is according to the hope of eternal life that we have. I want you to hear this. If we, if we will not receive that, that fact that we're righteous in God's sight, what's more, but we, have, we have become, that, that we are literally the righteous of God that destroys our faith. It will destroy your faith. If you're living in a constant thing of fear, now, fear is not the opposite of faith. Some people say that, and, and that's okay if they want to say that. No, the opposite of faith is unbelief. So, so get that. But where there's fear, it will cast out faith. Not the opposite of, 
But it's just the result of what happens if you're not walking in faith. And so if you're not seeing the, the truth for what it is of your righteousness in Christ, it will begin to eat away at your faith because you can't go to the Word and see the opposite. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word. And so if you get away from the Word, you're going to start believing what maybe some man said, what some book said, what some podcast says. And sometimes we need to turn off the podcast, get out of the book, turn everything else off, and get into God's Word and let it speak to our spirit and change us. That's what will change me from glory to glory. His Word, His Word, His Word, His Word. And so I don't want my faith destroyed. I want my faith built strong. And then, as we said earlier, we remain spiritual babes. And we're not able to grow up in the things of God because we're still stuck down here thinking it's about me and what I've got to do and how I've got to do it. Listen, nobody wants to be around an adult who acts like a child. We all know somebody. If you don't know somebody, it may be... Maybe it's you, but, <laughs> but we all know adults that act like a child. And it's like, oh, bless you. You know, and I'm just going to throw us men under the bus. Women, you, 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 you're not their mother. Husbands, they ain't your mama. Grow up and be a man. When Paul said it, what did Paul say? When I was a child, I spake as a child, I act like a child, but when I became an adult, I put away childish things. This is free, but some of you guys need to put away some childish things. All right? And it's okay, you know? Listen, there's nothing wrong with video games, but come on, 24 7? While your wife's sitting there in a room by herself and you're out there playing your video, come on, man. Enjoy the wife of your youth. It's actually pretty cool if you'll try that. Better than a video game. <laughs> I think everybody in here's got ears that can hear that. There ain't no little ones in here. Okay. All right. So nobody wants to be nobody wants to be around an adult acting like a child. It's just like, good grief. You know? Well, this, you know, in the church, we don't, we don't, don't give yourself an excuse to stay a baby. Well, I'm trying. Well, quit trying and get into God's Word and let Him be your strength where you're weak and let's grow up. I don't want to be falling for the same lie of the enemy that's causing to destroy my faith five years from now as I am today. I want to be growing in my walk with Him so that a year from now, a month from now, that I am not who I was because I am being changed but, and I'm growing up in that and so I'm not going to stay a babe because that's not attractive in the church so eventually it wears and it wears out the best of us listen I am all about helping people I am all about, about you know getting people out of the ditch and stuff but listen, if I'm having to get you out of the ditch every week and we've been doing this for four or five years, I'm getting tired. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm going I'm to pick up a phone, call somebody else and say, hey, I'll go help them again. I done, I done tried everything I can to keep them out of that ditch. Sometimes we got to learn how to drive the vehicle and quit getting in the ditch. But that wears, it'll wear on you. you. You all have people that you've, you know, maybe tried to be there for. And, and it's like you're loving to be there for them, but not over the same issue a year from now, two years from now, three years. From now. That wears. So we've got to understand, get into the Word, begin to grow up so we don't stay in that place. We can't afford to live another day in the deception. We have to know that we are the righteousness in God in Christ. We have to reject all the, the other junk that, that, that the devil tries to put out there and move on from that. And the Bible says that there exists in the world today an accuser. Do you know you have an accuser? And he lays the blame on us day and night. You can read that in Revelation and Zechariah. And he's there. Now, the good news is, yes, I have an accuser, but I also have someone who stands as my attorney. And so when the devil tries to accuse and go, 
Well, Stephen, uh, he broke the law again. My attorney steps up and goes, uh, looks like to me he's never done a thing. And then the same person who says that says, now, I took his punishment. Oh, he's guilty. But now, he has my righteousness. So, devil, see you later. Now, he, he goes night and day to do this, so he'll, he'll come back. But see, I have an attorney that stands guard 24 hours a day. Always there. Always there to do this for me. But many precious brothers and sisters in the Lord sometimes will quit. They'll get out of church and quit because they think, I, I just cannot measure up. They're trying to measure up to something. You can't measure up to something that you already are. You can't, you don't get more saved the longer you've been saved. This isn't a level thing. Well, how are you doing? I'm doing good. How's your salvation? Well, I got saved when I was seven. I'm 58 today. Pretty good level. Moving on up. It's not how it works. Because when you live like that, that, that is a pressure to live under that you can't handle. And that's why many people go, I can't do this. Because a lot of times we come to church and we think everybody's got it together at church. Because you know, sometimes we do. We put on our little, you know, we put on our bed. We put on our, we call it our Sunday bed. We put on our Sunday bed. You know, and, and, and then somebody who's struggling comes in and goes, well, I can't go to church. Why? Because look at all of them. They got it together. They don't have issues. They don't have problems. They don't have hiccups in life. They don't have issues. They, they, they're, they're all just doing great. They're all doing wonderful. I can't live up to that. Well, if you're here today, got good news for you. Look around the room. We are messed up. <laughs> we messed up, but we are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So join the company and be messed up with us as we, as we grow up together. Amen? And that's what it's all about. Don't quit today thinking you've got to measure up. Somebody already measured for you. So don't, th don't throw in the towel. I don't know what I said. What did I say? I <laughs> Go back and watch the live stream later because I don't know what I said. <laughs> I don't know. I don't, some things I write down, some things I don't. So you, yeah. But it was good, I think. All right. So don't throw in the towel. Don't quit because you think you can't. It, you got to escape that feeling. Now don't, get, don't get caught up. Paul said, listen, remember he told Galatians, we looked at it last week, who has bewitched you? Who has cast a spell on you to think that you've got to do this to get something that you've already been given? That's the devil in his game. So turn over to Colossians chapter 2 a minute. Colossians chapter 2. Now th this is a wonderful portion of Scripture that, well, I believe it kind of like solidifies the fact that you are righteous in God's sight. And you, you can't, you, 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 you can stop trying to measure up. Because see, if you get in that mode of trying to measure up, you're never going to measure up. You're always going to come short. And so that's what you, you've got to understand that. And so you can stop trying to measure up. You can cast off forever any a type to gain God's approval. He loves you while you were a sinner that he died for you. How much more? If he loved you while you're a sinner, now that you're his, good grief. Doesn't go the opposite direction. Because you believe in Christ Jesus, you already have it. You're not trying to attain it, and you're not even trying to work to keep it. It's yours. Colossians chapter 2, look at verse 9, 9 and 10. For in him, this is, this is Christ, in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That's why Jesus could say, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. He's the fullness Jesus Christ is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And then he says this, And you, say me, are complete in him. What? I, 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 I'm complete? See, when it's complete, that means I, can't, I don't need to be adding to it. I don't have to do something else 
See, that's what was happening with the, with the, well, I, the good old Pharisees, the legalist Pharisees. When Paul started preaching salvation by grace through faith, the Pharisees would come in, the, 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 the people who were for the law, the Jews would come in and say, you know, it's okay to do that, but you've got to be circumcised. But you've got to, and they started trying to add their stuff to it. And when you put your faith and trust in Christ for salvation, it's faith plus nothing. There is not room for you to add anything there. Or to even try to take anything away. You are complete in Him. It doesn't get any better than that. You say, well, I know I'm hammering it because I, 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 it breaks my heart to see believers falling short of what they can be because they're trying to do something instead of realizing that it's already done and you are complete. When you know you're complete, then it changes you on the inside. And you will begin to sin less. Why? Because you're complete. Where you're weak, He is strong. You don't need any extra. Yeah, you know, I know we say things sometimes, and I'm a stickler for words. I am a stickler for words. Sometimes we say things in church that sound so good, but they're so unscriptural. Oh, Lord, what we need is more of you. No, you don't. You've got all of Him. We don't need to come together and pray. Lord, we just want more of you. No, you can't pray for more of him when you've already got all of him. You are complete in him. See, if you think you're not, the devil will convince you that you need more of him and you keep falling short. But when you realize that you're already complete in him, you will then begin to go forward and grow. So make sure when we say these little church things that we say, that it lines up with the word of God. Satan loves us to be, to be messed up about understanding what the Word says. Know what the Word says and quit falling for the enemy. If you hear somebody preach, if you hear somebody say something that's contrary, now you're not going to know it's contrary if you don't do 2 Timothy 2.15. And that is study to show yourself proof. And I'm just going to put this out here. Sometimes we spend more time on social media, more time on the news than we do in here. And sometimes we need to shut all that stuff off and get more time in here. Then when we hear that other stuff out there, it won't affect us like it used to because we know this and not what we saw, heard, or felt, or whatever. We need to be word people. And we need to be studying. I've never met anybody that studied the Bible too much. You ever been around somebody and go, they just know too much Bible. No. We can't get enough of it. Gavin said he's read Ephesians 500 times. I'm probably pretty close with you, if not a little more. But I can tell you this. Every time I read it, it's like I've read it for the first time. Something new comes out. Oof. Something new comes out. Something new comes out. Can't help it. Get in there. Let it get into you. So he says, for him who dwells in the fullness of Godhead body, you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. We need to understand that, that he's, he's over all principality and power. It's not what happens in the White House. It's what happens in his throne room. Quit letting what the CNN and the CBS and, the, and all them other initials say that gets you all upset and frustrated. You need to understand that he is over principality and power. This is why I'm telling you, this is election year. This is free. This is election year. And listen, I pray about who to vote for. I pray and I, I'm going to vote for righteous. I'm going to go with the person who stands with the word of God the most. Because I probably ain't going to find anybody maybe perfect. Because there ain't none. So I'm going to find the one that stands closest to righteousness. I always say there's three things that I look for. I'm going to look for someone who believes that marriage is between a man and a woman because that's what God instituted. I'm going to look for someone who believes that, that, that Israel is God's earthly people and they're going to stand and support that. I'm always going to do that. I'm going to always stand there. That's what I'm going to look to. I'm going to look to that constantly, constantly. I'm going to look to that. So I'm going to vote. But, when I hit that little button and I walk out of that room, I am at total peace no matter what happens. Yeah, but if we don't get this person, who is in charge? That person or God? Well, quit losing your mind over your person not getting in the White House or getting in the White House. 
let that go. The, this world's not your home anyhow. Vote righteously. Put your trust in now who's in the principality and power because God is going to put up and take down who he needs up and who he needs down. I don't want to say, I only want this person, God, because that might not who God needs in there. Remember, it was Israel who said, oh, we want a king. We want a king. We want a king. God said, you don't need a king. You don't need a king. We want a king. We want a king. He gave him a king, and they complained about it ever since. And so quit telling God what you want. You say, God, not my will, but thine be done. Whatever you want, whoever you need in the White House to accomplish what you need done, I'm with it. I may not be comfortable, but you're not for my comfort. You're for your plan. And then when it doesn't go the way I wanted to go, I'm okay. Well, it got stolen, and it got, I don't care. God's going to put up, and he's going to be in office who he needs in office at that time for a purpose and a plan. Now, that was free. It had nothing to do with righteousness, but I'm just telling you, it has to do with you understanding that you're complete in him, and he has all over principality and power belongs to him. And if you're his, you put your trust in him, and the rest of it, you just go. Just go with it. Look at verse 14. Go down to verse 14. Here's what he said he did for us. Remember when we talked about the law? Here's what, here's what Christ did. Having wiped out the handwriting, this was on the tablet that Moses had, okay? The handwriting of requirements that were against us. Now, there were 10 of those. Now, by the time the Pharisees got done with it in, in the Gospels, there was something like 680 laws. That's what man does. We don't know what else to do. Just put another law up. You know, not like we're going to keep the other ones, but we're going to make more because that's what we need is more laws. So he says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that were against us. Folks, that means it's, it's no longer held to you anymore. It's been taken care of. He came and did it. He says it was contrary to us. We, it, we were sunk, but he came and he wiped that out. And he has taken it out of the way. When did he do this? Nailed it to the cross. Done. Done. We cannot be ignorant of the righteousness that we have. We cannot remain babes. That's a tragedy. We don't want to do that. I want you to know this. The devil just loves to deceive us. And he'll use any means. But when Jesus was in the desert, and Satan came in. Satan hadn't changed, by the way. Same thing that he hit, hits us with is the same thing that he hit Adam with, which is the same thing that he hit Christ with. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. No matter what they are, they're going to fall in one of those three categories. And so when he came to, to Jesus in the desert, he hit him with lust of flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. And at every turn, Jesus said this, it is written. He gave him the word. Your defense against anything the devil brings into your life is the word. It's the word. So when the devil comes in, He's trying to bring condemnation to you. He's trying to tell you this is all up to you. I'm just going to run through some things here. We just read it in Colossians 2, 9 and 10. You're complete in Christ. You're complete. That's what the Word says. Grab a hold to it. You're more than a conqueror through Jesus Christ who loved us. Romans 8. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. Philippians 4. God will always lead you to triumph. 2 Corinthians 2.14 There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Romans 8 You'll, You have all wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.30 That's the Word. That's what the Word says. So the answer to every one of these questions is, when does this happen? The moment you get saved. Now, whoop, it's done. You're not waiting for any of those things to take place. It's already taken place the very moment you place your faith and trust in Him. It's a done. It is done. It is finished. I got several of those scriptures, but I'm not going to 
I'm going to give you these scriptures. You can write them down, go read them for yourself. I don't have time to hit them all. 2 Corinthians 5, 18 through 21. We read 5, 21, but go back and read 18 through 21. Romans chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. Then I'm going to read this one. We'll close with this one. This is Colossians 1, 13 through 21. It says that he has delivered us from the power of darkness. It didn't say he was delivering us. It says he has delivered. That is a past tense word. For those of you who are in the English, that's past tense. It means it's already did. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us or literally taken us and put us into the kingdom of the son of his love. You've been placed in his kingdom. In whom, talking about the son of his love, Christ Jesus, here's what we have. Not trying to obtain, not trying to work for. We have redemption through his blood. That means we have been bought, purchased. That's not all. The forgiveness of sins. Now, I know I, oh, what I'm about to say is going to make people mad again. Here we go again. My nose is running because I'm feared that people are going to take me wrong. All right. All right. Here it is. You are forgiven. Quit living life like you're not forgiven. You're forgiven. But I messed up today. Then repent. But you're forgiven. What does repent mean? It means you turn from that. Stop doing it. But you are already forgiven. You're not trying to obtain forgiveness. You are, according to his word, not my word, that you have been conveyed, you have been delivered out of the power of darkness, you've been put in the kingdom of his son, you have redemption, you have forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. This is the guy who holds all this for us. By him, all things were created that are in heaven, that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities of powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him, all things consist. See, I don't ever doubt what's going on because I know everything's about him. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell. We read about that in Colossians. And by him to reconcile all things to himself by having made peace through the blood of his cross and you, say me, who were once alienated, who were once enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he has reconciled. So what do I do next? Now that I know this, what do we do? We live Live. Live for him. Know where your standing is. Know that it's done by his spirit. John 6, says this. It is in the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. So praise Jesus. Let's grow in the realization that God has made us the righteousness of of who he is and quit letting the devil have a day. The Bible says to give no place to the devil. I don't give him credit for the things he may bring to me. I said this, I think, last week, the week before. Some of the things I go through had nothing to do with the devil, had to do with my stupidity and what I did. But when the devil does try to do things to me, he can't do it to me unless the Father agreed to do it, allow him to do it. So that means, according to Romans 8, 28, that all things work together for the good of them that love him and are called according to his purpose. That means if something happens to me that I'm blaming the devil on, I know this, it's for my good because there's something that God needs me to grow up in and I need to quit hangering down and complaining and moaning and groaning and grow up and then I can move on to my next issue that the devil tries to accuse me of. But I'm going to keep hanging on the same one until I give in, grow up, and live in the righteousness of who God has called me to be. Amen. Mm -hmm.